Uh, yes, we do. Hello. I am Dave Sigler. Robin? Hi, Robin. Hi, I'm Sir. Hi, Michael. Shake, shake. Are you here, Robin? I've seen you around, and I think we have a few friends, and but uh, nice to. I think years ago you were at another Mitchell Solid Waste meeting, maybe when I was also in the yes. audience. I, I remember coming once to, to a meeting when they were talking about the process of the red pumpkin thing. We won't stir that up again. Um. It would be good to have this on the screen so that we can talk about it. Sure. If, we can, if you want me to do it, I can do it, or you can do it. No, this is what I, I like. I was going to help you with this. Like this. No, I don't. I'm just teasing. <laughs> so one of you yeah. who was Sorry. here last time, remind me, how long, is, how many years is the contract that we signed? Three years. Three years? Yeah. Three years. yeah. The waste contract? Yeah. Three years. Yeah. I was thinking three, but then I thought that sounded short, but then I hmm. thought it was three for a week, you know, because... We, we could only sign a three-year contract. Yeah. Theoretically. There are any number of ways to interpret that. Of course, the long-term viability of the waste management landfill is also in question. So, I think it's the same as before. Three with an option to extend it to five. Okay. Um, cool. So normally we live stream this on YouTube. Um, however, I think I've been locked out of the town YouTube channel. And um, thanks to two factor authentication. So I'm going to record this to the cloud and um, then I'll upload it later. So, for all of you that have loved ones who are planning to watch this on YouTube and they're anxiously texting you, you can let them know that, uh, well, they could also join them by clicking on the Zoom link, but I, I bet it's probably pretty limited. Um, who wants to do that anyway? So let's see here, make sure that but the recording does depend on the audio from the owl. So it's important to try as hard as possible not to all talk at once and to speak loudly and all of those things we're supposed to do anyway. Do we know if Crystal's coming in? Um, she said she was going to, and I thought she understood where to come, but I'm not sure. It can be confusing. So, yeah, I told her it was on the side street mm -hmm. near Long Green. Oh, that's helpful, yeah. I remember the first time I ever tried to come to a meeting here, and it's like, mm -hmm. couldn't figure it out for the life of me. Right. I had an issue, too. <laughs> I may not have said long grain, I think I said the restaurant, but still, um, but still, she, she should figure Maybe out somebody that should when go the door is locked, but, um, yeah, because people want to go in all the other doors. Yeah. Yeah, I just happened to notice the name on the door. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I always think, oh, we really I didn't need to get the direct access to the outside. <laughs> oh? Yeah, sure. Yep, that's Crystal. <laughs> We were just wondering if you knew where to find it and should I go wander around in the front door? <laughs> <laughs> Folks, everybody, this is Crystal from Hope. Hi, nice to meet you. Too. Oh, hi, nice to see you. Yes, you too. Any place I need to sit? Anywhere you want. <laughs> and I discovered this workshop thing. Well, let me use Word. All right, I'm just ready here. very much. Uh, welcome to the Midco Solid Waste Board of Directors meeting. It is 6.33, August 28, 2024. 
This meeting will serve as our annual meeting, which we kind of postponed. Um, we got a few things to take care of tonight, some housekeeping items. I think the first thing I'd like to do, I know everybody has said, hi, I'm so-and-so and everything, but I think I'd like to go around the room so that I personally can put a face to a name. Um, I am the sitting vice chair of last year's um, <laughs> Midco Solid Waste Corporation because the chair has moved out of Rockport, so he's not here. So my name is Kern Lake, and I am vice chair of the Lincolnville Select Board, so I'm one of Lincolnville's um, representatives. And I'm Robin Tarantino, and I'm on the Select Board in Lincolnville as well. I am Sarah Smith from Hope Select Board. I'm currently the chair. Crystal Robinson, Hope Select Board. <laughs> Michael Thompson, member of the Rockport Select Board. Frank Kevin Preston. Well, Dave St. Laurent, Nico Solid Waste Mail. I'm Matt, I'm the Administrative Assistant at Nico Solid Waste. I'm Allison Keller. I am the current treasurer of Micro Solid Waste and a member of the Camden Select Board. Perfect. Everybody all set with that? Okay. Um, I don't run a meeting any different than anybody else, other than I ask for people to please respect whoever is talking um, and let's try to stay on top. That's all. That helps us. I, I really, we have had meetings that have gone on three and four hours, maybe even longer, I think. Um, we'll try to keep our meetings to a couple hours at the most, if we can, unless we've got things that really need attention. Um, the first item on our agenda, an annual board meeting action item, uh, review and approve uh, the April 24th, 2024 meeting minutes, which be, would be our last attended meeting. If I could have a motion. I would move that we approve the minutes. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Yeah, so I think this, this I, might be a good time to bring up also for every, anybody that doesn't know just how many of us are new here. The, the old ones know that there are a lot of new people, but um, I think this is the, the highest turnover percentage we've ever had on this board. So three of us are returning. Um, Sarah, your first year was last year, right? Yeah, I'm um, still relatively new. I've only been to, to neither of them. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, so most of us weren't weren't here. So um, you can either abstain or Everybody normally likes to abstain when they weren't at a meeting, but um, then I guess only three of us can vote on it, and that's not a quorum, but I guess that's okay. Yeah, everybody, it's still everybody a vote. Vote. Right, I, I mean, abstaining is still a vote, so. Yeah, it is. Okay, so is uh, there any you, other? Can you oh, ask yeah, in terms of substantive things, any, three people? What's that? Can you. Um, We've got we've got a town administrator who's good on technical details. Um, when we've got a tie, like a two-two tie, the motion fails. So if we've got a three-three, um, will the motion to approve the minutes? I think It'll be okay because as long as you don't vote against it. Right. Uh, Abstentions okay. are just taken out of the mix. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So no. I do think we just have a couple of little things to fix. Um, the uh, Boucher is Bouchard. Um, in one spot. Um, on the meeting minutes? Yeah, there were I noticed. typos, but misspelled a germ, but I figured that was really <clears throat> minor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Main Resource Recovery Association, not Main Resource and Recovery Association. Um, but other than that, um, I can I can send that to you later, Beth. Just a couple of typos that I <laughs> noticed, but I didn't see anything substantive. Is there any other discussion on that process? Can we go to a vote? Okay. All those in favor? Do you 
the report Those abstention. Those opposed or abstention? Abstention. abstention. So three abstentions. And one. Anybody opposed? Yes, no. And no, anybody opposed? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item uh, on the agenda would be election and approval of offices of the corporation. The chair, the vice chair, secretary, and treasurer. Um, I'll entertain a motion uh, for the uh, seat of the chair. I would nominate Colonel Late to be chair. I would second that motion. Any discussion? Motion has, has been seconded. Is there any discussion? Anybody? Are you willing to take it? Willingly accept I will willingly accept that. That or the vice chair or I'll. I won't. It doesn't matter. It's, it's about the, the will of the, of the corporation. Um, okay. There's uh, no no um, discussion or anything. All those in favor? Those opposed? We have uh, one percent. That's the good way of. I have to vote. Well, you don't have to. Already. That's when you show. I think people abstain when they vote for those who are the themselves. I think you should vote for Okay. You can abstain. Uh, the Unanimous next, what's, what's that? Unanimous or one abstention? One abstention. Well, I was one of the things that are nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the next uh, would be the chair of the vice chair. Do I have a motion uh, for the vice chair? Not seeing anything around. Do you have something? Allison. 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 Okay, for vice chair. And I second that. What do you want to do? Well, do you want to be treasurer still? Right. So, um, I, my thought on that, I would like to be um, both. Both. Um, <laughs> and I think that somebody else could grow into either position. Um, I like the. I, I like doing the finance part and going over the budget. And, and you know it. Right. It's an odd thing. I never thought I would get into it, but having not had managers for a few years, and um, I ended up having to learn it. And so I do en enjoy that, but I think somebody else could slowly learn to do it. Um, I don't think there, I don't think there's a conflict between being both things as long as it didn't have to turn into, um, you know, if I ever did, if Kern were to leave, um, then that I would be chair and, yeah, that, but, that, that would be too much. Um, All right, let's get, let's get this done first. So we, well, we've want, got a motion. The yeah. issue is that I don't want to be locked into the vice chair, then it means I can't be treasurer. So it's, I think that's why we're kind of discussing it now. What the, everybody's I don't think there's a rule, but if there's like a comfort level thing with how people feel or um, it's an odd situation where we have so many new Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, I, I don't feel um, secure enough in knowing diddly squat about <laughs> Midcoast Solid Waste to offer to be the vice chair and I'm the only other person here besides you that has any memory of any meetings. You guys are all new. So I'm perfectly fine with you doing both, and then if you want to revisit it, if you want to revisit it, um, or something comes up down the line, I'd be quite amenable. The vice chair doesn't really have any responsibilities unless the chair goes away. So it's yeah. kind of okay. So we've got a, a motion and a second for the vice chair for Allison McKellar. Any more discussion on that? Okay. We'll go to vote. All those in favor? Unanimous. Those opposed? The one on Okay. The next seat would be the secretary. I'd be happy to nominate myself. I like being the secretary. I'm the secretary of the budget committee and if, you know. If you looked over the I was about to say well, I was looking at the record the votes and proceedings. Yeah. It seems like it's one of those things because from from a time when there weren't professional staff to oh, do it. So um, 
So your your role, I think there are a couple other times maybe when the secretary had to sign something potentially if the board votes to do that, but you know, mostly would, I guess it would be sitting in for Beth if we yeah. ever needed to do that. That hasn't so she already she does the minutes, the actual minutes. So, okay, yeah. so we know okay. that we know that Robin would take that, but I have a motion. I move to um Heard Robin, unless anybody should. I'll say. second it. Okay, unless I don't want to. Anyone else want to? We want to disrespect nope. Sarah if Sarah move, was willing for. No. <laughs> okay, move, move and second it. Thank any you, any Thank more you, discussion Robin. on that? Every, everybody's good with that? Oh, yeah. Okay. All those in favor? And the final, the final seat would be the treasurer. Do I have a nomination for uh, treasurer? I'll nominate Allison. I'll okay. second it. Okay, so we have seconded. Any more discussion? Nothing. And like, like uh, Allison referenced, we may revisit that down the, down the road. Um, yeah. So the treasurer, would they, they go in and sign the warrants and stuff, and look over the the bills and then it's kind of odd it forces the treasurer to be the chair of the finance committee rather than the finance committee choosing their own chair but uh, okay so anyway. there's no no more discussion all those in favor that was easy mm -hmm. i'm so excited about all okay. these new members and uh, i think we have three. a really board actually <laughs> Item number three, establish weighted votes for the fiscal year 2024-2025. Uh, <laughs> yeah, as you can see, uh, in the annual meeting notes for August 28, 2024, the weighted votes for the fiscal year 2024-2025, the percentage for each participating town. Yeah, so this isn't something that we can, uh, it is what it is. Really, it is what it is, it is but it I think it's, it it's kind of our chance to check and make sure that it's correct, because this is what's used to determine, you know, the percentage of the assessments and how much each town pays. And so I think it's it's kind of like signing the school warrant a little bit. And as, as long as Sam says the number's right, I'm fine with it. <laughs> is it, just so I understand, is it percentage of um, Budget for I'm assuming it's a correlation. Yeah, so it's a combination of um, population and valuation. Could I have a motion to adopt the weighted votes for fiscal year 2024 to 2025? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any more discussion? All those in favor of the weighted votes for the fiscal year 24 to 25? Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda, fee schedule review and approval for, of fiscal year 24-25. These are our fees um, for our users, and we look at these constantly. And if you look at our um, year-end numbers for last year, we did a very good job of, of hitting what we needed to do, but yet uh, making sure the customer was somewhat happy. Yeah, we may need to look at these again yeah. midway through the year, but the idea has really been over the years to shift the burden from taxpayers onto mm -hmm users so that you know you're paying for what you dispose of and not what your neighbor disposes of and um, so the starting back in 2000 2001 it really started to move in that direction and kind of gotten better and better we could have a you know more of a discussion later whether we should continue to try to lower the assessments even more or you know what level of taxpayer support we expect <laughs> I could have a motion. Oh, sorry. Sure. One other thing, depending on what happens, because some of this stuff we're 
we're uh, at the will of the vendor that we use. And there is potential for cost increases that could happen anywhere throughout the year. And at that point, we would bring those forward and recommend changes to those fees to cover the cost of our cost. As a curiosity, how has the $1 minimum been accepted by the people going? Have they been, I think it's large, but I'm just curious if anybody has any feedback on the acceptance rate. <laughs> I grumble about it, but I can't. Yeah. <laughs> the one dollar minimum? Yeah. Is that something you can see that just running up and go? Oh, like if you go over the scale and you have like two pounds, oh, you know, no. two pounds. No, and... like you just in the plastic in the bins, like if you have like a oh, you just... plastic bag that's not a yellow bag. I mean, you can't use the dollar or whatever. Oh, make sure you're not your using receipts. yellow bag. Yeah, make sure your receipt is yeah. there so they can. I don't think I've ever heard anybody complain about it. I always, I never have. It's like I, I've been asked two times, Do you have a receipt? Yeah, I'm okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's yeah, what you're doing good. a much better job yeah, with that. Yeah. I was going to, yeah, that's yeah, one thing we've been focusing on. I think it's in the report. It is, yeah. yeah. Right, because people try to say, Oh, I'm going to go over the scale, and then they don't. Oh. Or, you know, then they get to the hopper and they're throwing things away, and it might not be what they'll say they've already paid, but sometimes they haven't and there's no way that the person at the hopper can know what they've paid at the gatehouse yeah. so we're trying to tighten that so that everybody is expected to have a receipt to be able to show jeff um usually at the, at the hopper um, well, something one of the things that can happen is somebody can come in and say hey i have this metal and these other things can i go over and get rid of all these things first and then i'll come back around and, and i'll weigh my, my waste but then they don't ever go back around and weigh the waste. They get rid of the metal, they go right to the hopper, and they froze. I mean, it's going to happen in any system that you have, um, but it's just a check and balance from what people pay for at the gate and what they dispose of at the other end. So. Okay. The like dollar goes to each miscellaneous category, because we typically in four areas, so if it's landfill or MSW or, um, you know, somewhere that the, like, a hobby that they have to pay, but this is just to make it more level so that people aren't coming in going only have this. So it's work, working. They talk about on the radio talk. Can I ask a question? Um, what about, I mean, I see computer, it says CPU unit only, and then it says monitors, but what about laptops or tablets? Or La laptops, anything with a screen is Consider the CPU. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then it's, it's, well, it's separate from the, the actual hard drive. The CPU is the computer right. or a laptop. Right, or right. the monitor. And the monitor is or CRT, cathode ray tube. Well, they're both ten dollars, so I guess it doesn't Right. The, the the cathode ray tube has changed to kind of a CRT with the new display screens. It used to be the big tube. Yeah. Right. Do you remember? Yeah. Now it's the LED. Yeah, so now it's a little different. Uh, I think laptops fall under the so a computer CPU. Right, the laptops fall there, and, and other devices like a tablet or a, a Kindle, Winter. Fire, you know, the e readers, do those, are those considered? Because they are basically computers. I believe they are. are. Um, they're all considered computers. The reason they separate out the, they say CPU you know, only is because some people will come through and they'll have the CPU and the monitor. Right. And so that's that's two things right. there. Um, but I think that, correct me if I'm wrong, but an iPad would be considered a computer? Yeah, the iPad is still down there. And they also have the battery. So the whole, the, whole, the whole purpose of that rule was once upon a time, all of those things that are in this category of universal waste were considered hazardous. And, and the hazardous waste rules were cumbersome and difficult. And there's a lot of re prerequisites to the handling them. So they, they basically rewrote the rule um, for these items that are considered hazardous, but are fairly, uh, that, that, that generate a lot of waste from the general public in there, like computer monitors, light bulbs. And they created this category called universal waste instead of hazardous waste. And they, they lightened the rules on how you handle those. So this is where this, all this nomenclature came from originally to handle this waste. 
and uh, it, it's in a category all by itself, and it has to be uh, counted as it comes in, and it has to be sent to certain places, but that's kind of the basis of the universal racial rule. Okay. So that's the green building that you see when you go in, kind of in the middle, um, right after the recycling containers. If you ever need a power cord or something, it's a great place to find one if you, uh, if you know who to ask. <laughs> so, so just so you know, it's 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 computer monitors, it's it's uh, computers, it's fluorescent tube it, tubes and lighting, small lighting, uh, light uh, batteries, little button batteries, lead acid batteries. Those all fall into the universal waste category. So the little like the little button thirty twos. Those button ones. So anything that says NICAD, lithium, any of those things, those are considered universal waste. Lead acid batteries are different. Lead, ad, lead acid batteries or zinc are not a universal waste and can be thrown away in the regular waste stream. But anything that's lithium, NICAD, um, nickel halide. So yes, they're technically those little 2032. The little button, right. tiny little button batteries, those are all in that category. So but so I'm you can give them at the gatehouse to the So the the button batteries should not go in the garbage bag? No. Right. No, like like your regular Okay, because they're alkaline. I think oh. no? depends it depends on the button battery. Most if it's lithium or I NICAD. They're not, they're not uh, lithium. Yeah. Like, don't mean they don't get to them. You have to look on them. It's, if it says N I C A on it. Yeah no yeah, I know, I know the yeah. what it looks like. That's hazardous. Universal. So, well, yeah, it's universal. Oh, no. I don't know. But, but uh, like, ones that aren't, this is probably the easier thing to, to explain, is lead, lead acid batteries are uh, uh, zinc batteries, but like the 9 volt, you know, the, the double A, the triple A, those are non hazardous. Button batteries generally are. Yeah, it's, it's too bad that they're not. There's not more exposition in here for the different kinds of batteries because I've yeah. done the same thing. Because I, Sarah I just threw out. I, well, I thought that it was a little battery, so it was supposed to go into the garbage. So yeah, I mean, something we, that my husband dumped yesterday. We could put something on the monitor right at the front of the uh, right at the front of the uh, gatehouse. So <laughs> so the reason why lithium are hazardous is lithium are reactive. Yeah, and when they touch something and they, you, you combine, you touch the two terminals, they can create a fire. So usually what happens in handling those, you get them and you have to take off one side, put them in a bag, so they're separated when you store them. Those, that's the one reason for lithium being hazardous. The NICAD, they're hazardous because of the metals in them, nickel cadmium. So maybe we could find them, I agree that looking at it more carefully, it would be good to think about what we call all these things, and so it makes yeah, it a little I mean, more universal, clear. universal, non-universal, it's confusing, it and, and batteries are always one that people have questions on. Yeah, reason. and I don't want to put them, them where they shouldn't be. It doesn't, it it doesn't explain. Deals where it, no matter how much information you have there, it's always going to be a confusing thing. Yeah. Because be it's at home that the decision is made what to do with right. it, you know? And then when somebody gets to the transfer facility, they see information on the, on the board, which we need that there. I think it's a good place to put it. But they're going to, you know, oh my God, I've got this in the wrong yeah. area. It, but we it's, even, it's always going to happen. Maybe if there's some way to put up a, what do I do with my batteries? Well, oh, it should you know, be on the or something yeah. that a minimum is on the website so that you can go and check it. Because I've obviously been making mistakes. Maybe not. We have to look at the... I think that those aren't supposed to go in. I, I just looked up. It's, okay. It is the 2032 is a lithium battery, oh, which okay. I did not realize. So I'm really glad I did not put it in my suitcase. And the thing is, people don't, those are small off. items that people don't, we're not finding. There, there is a good reason to separate those from the waste stream. That's the reason that we take them for free, because there is a state program to try to incentivize people to pull them out. But if you don't tell people, then they're just putting them in their trash. And, yeah. you know, we don't ever notice so that would be one of the things that education would because a lot i mean a lot of people do want to do the right thing one more one more thing that goes in that category it's uh, mercury any kind of mercury oh, thermometers yeah. those kind of things. that's that's the one on the right so and the, don't the really old are the really old 
thermostats or they, they're mercury also. So, so the dial thermostat, yeah, when you pop the, them off, they'll have a vial of mercury. Yeah, a little vial of mercury. That is, that so, is okay. elemental mercury. Yeah, my son's Mercury's got those in his house. You need to keep the cover on, too. Don't take the cover off. Don't, don't take them apart. It helps it not get broken. We actually have one right now. We have yeah. Right, but the, the really old ones, you have to pop the cover off so that you can unscrew them from the wall. Yeah, but then you can just put the cover back on. Yeah, cover back, 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 on. back, on. back on. We, we change a lot of those where I work. Yeah. A fair amount of them. Typically, I have a box of it's about every month. So, so the mercury is bad because because it is bad. <laughs> well, it's, it, it volatilizes under room temperature. So if you were to break that open and you had a black light, you would see it kind of like going up in the air, and then it, it, it'll it'll gather on, on on like little dust particles and stuff like that. It'll come down in the rain. Bacteria will break it down and turn it from elemental mercury to methyl mercury, and then methyl mercury gets metabolized into Small organisms that moves up the food and chain. then comes ends up taking permanent residence in the swordfish. Yes, right that's that's where it ends up. Yeah. Okay, so, so if, if there's Facebook no more, yeah. if there's no more, then this review is for the fee schedule. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, detour. That's, uh, sorry about that. Right? Right. Know, right. But it was good. I think it's yeah, good to know good. these things yeah. as you're going through them. You know. Yeah. Just, so if I could have, I could have a motion for approval. Motion. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion? Yes. I have something. Did sure. you want to raise On this particular? Yes. yes. On the fees? Well, on the schedule, though, the, the writing up of it, I do think that we should change the, the <laughs> note on the batteries just to more specifically mm -hmm. say lithium, NICADs, you know, mm -hmm. should not be placed in household okay, so trash. For That's, our for our next meeting, we'll have that. You want that on the fee schedule? Well, yeah, just the because. description on the fee schedule is kind of silent on it, which makes us all make our our assumptions. Which I assume I did the same assumption that I was supposed to place in household trash. Yeah. Um, so and I think and people do but, look at the fee schedule. I think when people yeah. are with respect when people are driving into the dump, the last thing they're thinking about is reading something that's on the wall of the gatehouse so um but the, they will check the fee yeah. schedule at least sometimes what i think it is, it is so great to have some people actually looking at it and um i think that hasn't happened in a little while maybe we can have a little maybe, maybe you have a couple of us that just go over it and work with beth and dave to to improve some of the yeah. verbiage mm -hmm. eyes help yeah i'm reading that it doesn't it isn't really representative of what we're trying to say yeah i'm just looking at it let us about rechargeable it's not they don't necessarily have to be rechargeable okay. to be yeah and I, I wouldn't know what a lead acid battery is it's one in your car yeah but the, right that's the that's the problem is when it's done always by by people that speak in this mm -hmm. these kinds of yeah. terms um, we expect you to know the this way so as as this document sits the yes. fee schedule itself is good and we'll move that along we'll talk the next meeting on on uh, maybe changing the verbiage. On that. I think we, I we'll, think that can just happen. We'll just we'll just bring a draft of some changes. Yeah. Okay. We're not talking about changing fees or anything. No. Just, okay. Um, anything else? Cool. All those in favor? Cool. That's about yeah. Okay. We'll move into the regular board meeting. Um, public and director comments. The, this is an area for any of the uh, members of the board of directors to uh, comment on non-agenda items. Uh, if anybody has got anything they would like to bring to the board, uh, except for you, Sarah. No. <laughs> or the public. Yeah, yeah or the public. public, yeah. This is the time for that. So Sarah, go ahead. Um, just looking at the fee schedule, as long as we're looking at tweaks to it. Um, this is... Not in terms of dollars, in terms of information. This is for non-agenda <laughs> items. Okay. Okay. What, tell me when it's a good time to make a suggestion on, a, on an improvement we to this one. Let's have everybody send emails. But it's, I know, but it's, okay, I'll do it by email. 
I mean, I think everybody can send their comments by by email um, to Beth and Dave. And, yeah. Um, there's some things we can change. Things some things we might have to get yeah, the same. Okay. So, are there any comments, questions, concerns from people attending? Any of the directors, non-agenda pertaining to non-agenda items. Um, I, one of the things that mentioned in the minutes was the um, MRA, um, the Maine Resource Recovery Association meeting, and um, at the. I don't, did you include this in your manager's report? That no, I didn't. And sure. that uh, Chris and Kevin got the. I, you know, I should have put that in there. I completely forgot about that. Yeah. So maybe well, tell maybe them. Maybe they you can add that to your. If it's just a two of our not, two of our employees got an award from the Maine Resource Recovery mm -hmm. Association for being the was it Let's the operators of the year? It. Yes. Um, yeah. Fabulous. Yeah, Kevin yeah. Well, and maybe Chris. Chris Carpentier and Kevin Annis were received the operator of the year award at the Maine Resource Recovery Association. Nice. Well deserved. They're the two people that generally work in the recycle building. Generally, Kevin's the one on the forklift. Fantastic. They both really, they do a really good job. Anything else? Okay, next agenda item, review and approval of the April 24th meeting minutes. Well, we're going to do that twice, I guess. Oh, uh, sorry. We're good. We're good. Okay, we're going to skip over that one. Uh, so, I think everybody's had a chance to look at the facility manager's report, but where most of us are new. Can we do a little rundown for you? We, can you? Yeah, absolutely. That would be good. Okay, um, well yeah, it'd be, it'd, be, it'd be a good thing to pull up because these are some items that we've been working on for some time now. And I don't want to start at the infancy of every one of these things, but I'll give you just a general overview of kind of what happened. So, um, so our, one of our largest expenses at the facility is our uh, leachate collection and treatment. And um, we are currently working with a company to um, try to treat that waste on site. And um, one of the other items that's actually happening, which is also revolves around the cost of treating leachate, <clears throat> is we have a um, we have a extraction well, and it's located in the north quarry or wait, right south quarry, south quarry. Excuse me, where Allison is covering and that was an older an older um, extraction well it was basically just a well and what happened was back when it was installed um, they had they had specced it out they had put an inner <coughs> casing that had a different schedule piping which basically measures the thickness of the piping make a long story short it, it, it reduced the inside diameter of the pipe so when they put the pump in it it was only like an eighth of an inch clearance on each side of the pump and when it split to the bottom which was about the, the well was roughly 95 feet deep and what happened over time was the, the, the well casing um, kind of shifted and bent a little bit and then once it did that you couldn't pull the, the pump up anymore to service it so it failed and a prior manager they tried getting it out before I got here and it and they ended up ripping the cord and ended up landing in the bottom the bend was roughly around 65 feet. So um, we ended up having to put a pump on top of that area, which isn't deep enough in the well really to give you any real good buffer for when you have um, the spring and fall rains where the groundwater's become saturated. So you can't keep up with, you can't create any buffer and you can't, you couldn't keep up with the flow infiltrating into the landfill. The reason why we're pumping the landfill is the landfill is just imagine it's it's a big rectangular box and and the groundwater or the water in the landfill which comes from the ground and also from the atmosphere would migrate out of the landfill theoretically and contaminate the groundwater so you want to create a cone of depression with a well inside the landfill which then Wants, makes the water want to go towards the well so it doesn't want to leave the area. So that's the whole purpose of the well. And when you're trying when you're trying to manage that, we have a regulatory limit which is 98 feet mean sea level. And um, that's that's the first regulatory limit. 
if we end up, the water level ends up going above that, then we have to do some additional testing and the monitoring all around it. And then I think it's at 106. If we get the 106, it goes into Lily Pond. So this is all really critical to maintain. You want to create a buffer and a little bit of uh, breathing room. You know, let's say at the end of winter when spring's approaching, you want to kind of pull that water level down. So when everything starts melting, you have a little room so that doesn't go above the 98 feet and heaven forbid it goes over the 106. So get back to the well in the casing and, the, and what happened is if it's that 68, if it's that 65 feet, you, you really don't have much before you're at 98 feet in terms of pumping and, and, and it's, it's really easy to go over that number in the springtime. And there's a rule, a legislative rule that um, if, if this project, which was funded by DEB some time ago, was overseen and, and administered by the state, and if, if it fails for um, uh, an engineering reason after engineering review, they're actually regulated by law for, to refund that at a 95% uh, reimbursement. So I, 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 I propose that they, they had made this error and then they, they denied our request for funding this new well. And then I challenged them on it, on the technical merit of the original well, and they found in my favor that uh, they would have to fund and reimburse us for the installation of this new well. So this new well is going to be around 150 some odd thousand dollars, and we're going to be getting 95% reimbursement from the state for this well. So you'll see in the budget there's a carry forward of that amount, which was in last year's budget. It's being carried forward into this year's budget because we were having troubles with finding a well driller that will drill in the landfill. So we finally found one and we've got that going, but it's kicked off into the next year. So you'll see that in the carry forward. Um, but this new well casing is more robust. It's larger in diameter. And they're in the middle of, we've, we've drilled the new well. It's in the same proximity of the old well. It goes down 95 feet. Um, it's going to have a six inch casing and it has a gravel pack around it and we'll be putting a five horsepower pump which will be giving us a little bit more uh, capacity as opposed to like i think we had a one and a half horsepower pump because that was all we could fit in the old well because it was damaged so that was a huge project it's underway where where the well has been drilled the gravel pack has been installed we're in the process of now we're going to do some trenching out to the uh, disconnect to, to tie in the power supply and then we're going to have to repipe the plumbing with the fitness adapter which is buried a little bit lower than the um, waste level and we're probably going to add another nine feet onto the casing and, 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 and put more material around it because that will end up being the final elevation of the landfill the reason i'm doing that is i don't want to call these people back and add nine feet on after the fact. It's more difficult. So we're going to try and do all these things at the same time, but there's a lot of planning involved and um, we're really close to getting this done. I'd say we'll probably have it done in another another three weeks. I would imagine things will be completed. Um, so that's that's the, the South Quarry um, and that's where the landfill is and that's where the waste is, which, which you see you over see here. A 200 foot deep quarry full in the ground that filled out of water and now we have to pump it forever and ever and ever so, so any, yeah so this is also the closed portion of the landfill and we're basically we're in a cell development today we're trying to join these two mounds together and this is where our remaining capacity is which is roughly 15, seven to fifteen years fifteen years roughly so this is our north quarry over here and that, that's basically what this one used to look like before they filled with garbage back in the eighth day. So what we found here is um, another, this is all about leachate management. So leach, the leachate management. Can you see, they, my book, can my book, are you being polite? Can you see the Back before I got here, one of the prior managers, they installed a, uh, they installed a grout curtain, basically a wall right here right. to prevent the water from migrating from, from here to there and vice versa. Um, years ago, they used to pump out of here to do what we were talking about the well doing over here. So they were dragging the, the, the leachate, which is water that's come in contact with waste, 
over to here, which was diluting the wastewater and making it, and then they were sending it to the treatment plant. So the DP told them they couldn't do that anymore, they installed the well, and then what ended up happening was they started sucking the water from the North Quarry over to here, and which would add to the cost, because now you're not just dealing with the atmospheric water, you're dealing with groundwater and water that's, you know, filled this other quarry up. So, um, that adds to your cost, you, you know, and that's one of our biggest costs. So we want to reduce our leachate. So they, they, before I got here, they, they put in this new grub curtain and it was a, it was a big project. And what happened was, it worked oh, great. $700,000. Yeah, it worked great. It worked great. And then I, when I started this about, it's been about three years. Yeah. I was watching, because one of the things that we have to do is monitor, there's a, um, there's a, um, a gauge that is like affixed to the wall of the quarry. We look at it with binoculars and we, we write down the level. And what would happen is in the summertime it would go down and then it would come up a little bit more and it would go down and come up a little bit more until it reached a plateau. And then I started noticing it just wasn't going up anymore. And they were worried about this eventually overflowing and crossing the road and going through the other side. But it never did that. It just kept on getting to one point and then stopping. And in the summertime, we used to be able to shut this down because we didn't have a lot of water in the landfill. And, and because it was being, you know, we had separated the source over here and things were had tightened up and there was, it was, the pump was able to keep up with what was there. And we literally had to shut it down for two or three days at a time every week. That stopped happening. And then all of a sudden I noticed that our pumping had, was starting to increase and we couldn't keep up with it anymore. And this wasn't going anywhere. It was just staying at the sink. So I kind of made up pretty simple deduct deductive reasoning assessment that you know the water was coming from here to there and, and when we started looking into it this was something that they had possibly predicted happening. So the water is slowly finding its way over the top of that grow curtain, working its way back over here, and now we're pumping again a lot of water, increasing our costs. So one of the things that we did was we said, all right, well we need to we need to determine if we can pump this off as storm water. And bring the water level down to the point where it stops wanting to migrate to the other side below the route curve. So we we, uh, we we had a meeting with all of the different factions of DEP and it was determined that that was something we could do. So we created and we built just recently a dock. And you'll see it over there and it's, it's, this is the dock. And over here there'll be, so there's a pump that'll be, that's going to be submersed over here and it goes under the water and gets and it's just trenched across to over here and it goes to a like a meandering kind of stream not out of uh, river stone that we put in and when what we're going to do is we're going to start pumping this down to storm water so we filed a permit by rule uh, we got approved by, uh, to do this and now we're going to be uh, pumping that and then once we pump this down we'll be able to see you know, um, connectivity between the two and where it stops being connected and where we, and then we'll probably pump it down a little further and give us a buffer, make notes about where we have to keep that water level at. And then if possible, ultimately create a gravity feed system over to the other side. But that may not be possible depending on the elevation. So we wanna absolutely determine where that elevation is before we go and put infrastructure that's permanent. So this pumping system will work. We, I've done it at the other landfill I used to work at. It's a simple process. Um, it should work pretty good, and it'll kind of look like a little stream on the other side. Going to the One of the other things that we need to talk, think about when we do these things is how it impacts the place we put it. So one of the things that we're going to have to do is seasonally do this kind of uh, pumping so that we don't pump more into the watershed during wet times of the year, which will add to flooding issues. So this. You know, this is all another holistic uh, look at what we have to do to manage this in a responsible way where we're not impacting other people in the area. So we'll, we'll pump these things more aggressively during the summer months and during the dry season. We'll shut these things down, just like we have to shut this pump down during wet weather events so we don't send it over to the Camden Wastewater Treatment Facility, which then basically doesn't get treated and ends up going into the ocean untreated. It overflows at the yacht club specifically. Yeah. Where you see so, the all like overflowing. So that's kind of the leachate part. Um, and if you have any questions, 
I know that was probably a lot of stuff to kind of talk about in one, one, one scoop, but that's what it is. <laughs> so, and if you, I'll be more willing to talk with anybody on the side later on. Um, we should do a tour over there. I, I was yeah. going to say that usually, yeah, totally usually with the new people, like I did it with the last group. I brought everybody around and I gave everybody a tour at the same time and I explained all these things because they make more sense when you're standing there and I can move my hands around. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so is, is the water in the north or in fact all clean? Yes, it, it, it doesn't violate any of the primary drinking water standards. It's yeah. It's actually even better than that. Um, I feel like this is always <laughs> understated. So, so even the leachate, the, the stuff that we are required to, to treat that's been in contact with waste here, even that water does not violate any primary drinking water standards. Um, so, yeah. Um, no, you just missed the big, the big uh, grade up here. Did I? Yeah, but yeah. I'm sure you were. Yeah, so I had to do a sea level talk at Rockford Library, and I committed to it once in a while. No, that's fine. Yeah. We're, just, we're, ta yeah. we're talking about the, the the new well we installed and the pumping of the North Ward. Yeah, so even the even that leak tree doesn't violate any primary drinking water standards, um, and. You know that's this water. This water here is even you know much much cleaner than that. And as part of our consent agreement with the DEP, we have been required to test do really extensive water testing um, of of this quarry, of the leachate, and of numerous monitoring wells located all around the property for for decades. And so of any you know water body, we have just really extensive um, data on this one. Um, there are lots of fish in there, and uh, it's it's probably cleaner than the stream that it's going into, actually. But it's been always the most critical thing to try to make sure that uh, that water stays really, really, really clean. And um, because if it were to not be clean, then we could lose our ability to be able to let it spill over as, as storm water. Um, where are you discharging it? So it's it's basically crossing over here and going into this wetland right over here. And that'll be a seasonal pumping based on during drier times of the year. We don't want to introduce this extra pumping into the tributaries during the wet season because of the, we already have problems with flowage and drainage and storm water. So one thing that happened before Dave was here is I sat in meetings with the Rockport um, town manager and the Cameron town manager talking about the need to eventually let this overflow. And I remember Audra saying over my dead body, um, because knowing that on Belmont Ave and Lime Rock Street, we already have during extreme rain, we have some flooding. Uh, and so being able to do it, this is where the Camden connection is helping a little um, because we didn't have to ask Audra. I'm just, just kidding. But Dave's able to manage that knowing. I mean, I know exactly what I have to do so I don't create an impact. And it's kind of like, like I was saying earlier, um, but part of our, our agreement with the wastewater treatment facility is this, this is supposed to get shut down during wet weather events because we, we just can't handle the water flow. Right. So that's the same thing that's going to happen with Peter. And as I, to add into that, one of the, so this was, you know, it looks like not that great big of a project, but it was. We had to build the dock. We built all the ball, everything done internally. Uh, we put a disconnect on here. We had the pipe and trench across. We had to create the, the Riverstone uh, drainage flowage area, you know, and, and erosion control that towards the backside. Then, as I was looking at this, I, one of the things I had budgeted was I was supposed to create a tie-in uh, portable water to the hopper area for wash down, which we didn't have. We don't have any water at the wash down area. And I started thinking about it and I said, wait a minute, I have, I have water right here now. I'm gonna just try to tap into that. So what we're gonna be doing next is we're gonna be tapping into the outlet with a T. Uh, we're not quite done the project right now. We're gonna trench across this little part of the, where you go around where the hoppers are, bring it over here, and we're gonna put a cross proof standpipe uh, spigot so that uh, Jeff can do a little, you know, more cleaning in this area, which wouldn't that all be sore. So, so is the effluent when you pump it across? That is, a, that is uh, oh, 
Yeah, I'm sorry, the, wet, the, the wetlands effluent, does yeah. that then infiltrate or is it transmitted elsewhere? It, it's, it's a combination of both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not absolutely. It's kind of, it's kind of stormwater. Yeah, it's right. But my, my it's an alf, it'll be an alcohol. Right, but yeah. my question is, is the, uh, the discharge area, mm -hmm. is it then leaving the site or is it allowed to evaporate and infiltrate? There's a stream, there's a, is a stream that comes out of that. A little bit of both. The reason I'm asking is yeah. that could affect the flow of the pumping well at some point. Oh, well. That's the whole reason behind doing that. I know, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this the, the gradient flow of the water, I don't think is gonna move back towards the landfill. If it is, we're in trouble because we'd have to drain the whole area over there and kind of limit the amount of pump that we do over here. We know that that water from the wetland moves towards moves the ocean. Yeah. It um, does go towards the ocean. So when we first did this route curtain here, that's right, it's right, right here. Stop. It's the, the North Core used to be much lower because um, they got it down below the sort of gut area. They made that, that dam essentially, and we watched the water increase like a lot at a very steady rate for several years. And then it got to the point where it wasn't increasing anymore. Um, and it seems pretty clear that, that a lot of that water is migrating this way. The watershed boundary between what goes this way and what goes that way is very Close. Well, that's my last question. You know, we just got Lily Pond delisted from an area of concern. Exactly. Because of all the benefits that we have from the and all the other things. And I, I don't know the technical aspects, so I'm just asking whether or not Lily's really I mean, we've. No, this goes the other way. It goes, it goes, yeah. This goes away. It goes to Camden. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But this would be, honestly, not too bad water for Lily Pond. Not that it is going there, but it's. Um, I just wanted to say that the, the photos with the labels were really helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, having the aerial view to sort of understand the whole way of the land was very, very helpful. Can I ask? It would be better than on site. <laughs> yeah. If, yeah. If this water is so clean, is it a resource for the community as far as, you know, water for people to use for irrigation? I mean, we're trying to get rid of it. And if if part of getting rid of it could help other people. No, I mean, that would be like, uh, you know, tapping into the stormwater that runs down the side of your road, the catch basis, you know, all the stormwater system, kind of following that thought process. So you, you, you theoretically would tie into that as a source of water, which you could, I guess. I mean, but you can do a rain barrel too, which is yeah. you know, your own. Yeah, yeah but, but in terms of the resource for the community, I mean, the. The, the long-term vision here, which was started by Rob Moody and other town managers years and years ago, is like, it, it should be nice enough to be a park. It should be a place, um, you know, that eventually we were talking about cleaning out the, the perimeter of the quarry. All this trash was allowed to go in there. And, and it's, you know, for years was this place that you would never think about using, but it's, Hopefully one day we we're talking about stocking it with, with a rainbow trout or something, and uh, you know eventually kind of having that as a goal that it can be a whole facility. If you're standing here more. on a nice day, and you're looking that way. It's a heck of a place. You know, you feel, you feel like you're beautiful. At, you feel like you're at a like a state park or something. You're looking at the mountains, you got the quarry. If it wasn't for you know a little bit of the industrialized stuff in the background that you think you run a park. It, it is kind of cool. So if you get a chance, drive by and take a look at that area over there. You'll see where the, where the outlet is and it's discharging over here. And um, I guess to continue on the manager's report. So we're creating the, we're moving, we're, we're creating our new self, well, we're moving into our self-development plan, which is shifting where we basically put our waste for the next year. And that's all kind of moving this way. So we have to move the road back like from here to here. And we're creating a landing area here and then re-excavating all of this roadway, taking the good material out, reusing it on the roadway and the pad, and then taking the, the other material that isn't granular, that's more organic, that gets put bucked up in a pile, and then we use it for cover of the previous area we were working. So we're in the process of doing that right now. And then the next thing is we're working with um, 
company called Lead Jake Management Solutions, who's working with DEP currently on uh, on site wastewater uh, leachate treatment. So that in theory, we potentially could treat on site and not send this to the Camden wastewater treatment facility. So that's one of the other things that we're currently working on. There's been some conversations with um, the DEP about that, and um, right now we're waiting on wait, waiting on some answers to some questions that they had. Um, we have a we have a, a person named Mark Liner who's working. He works for Elite Jake Management Solutions. He's kind of a, like an expert in the in the area of leachate management on site. So we're going through the process. That was something that the prior board had voted to move forward with the looking at the possibility. Um, and uh, we're getting closer to probably having some answers on that. So we'll provide you with that as we get that information. Um, the other thing is we, you know, you can see that we've had some some um, unexpected breakdowns on equipment. We're doing quite a bit of uh, repairs and one of it is a freight liner that, that ended up, uh, when we went to have it inspected, it had some serious problems. We, uh, we had a lot of things repaired on that. Bulldozer track had come off. Um, we then had to move into the household houses waste collection day. That was one of our biggest years ever. Um, we are looking at potentially trying to do this on a Sunday moving forward because trying to do this while you're running the operation is extremely difficult. We had traffic <laughs> that basically I heard went all the way to Graphams. Um, and we had two lanes of traffic. I mean, we, we had a, and part of the management of that is also making sure that the company EPI has enough people on staff to handle this stuff as it comes through. It's it's a tough thing to manage. Everybody's just coming in all at the same time and they want to get rid of it. And you, have, you know, you have to have a chemist, you have to have certain people that can do this kind of work and they don't grow on trees and there are tons of them. So they, they usually have one chemist, a couple people that can handle the waste stream, so all this stuff needs to be identified and put into the right categories as it comes in and it dangerous. So we're going to try and possibly maybe look at doing this on Sunday um, next year. And there's also the suggestion that this we do two of these events as opposed to just one. Because, but, but that's something you'll need to think about during the budget because it's twice as much. It is the, uh, do you use the facility at all? I mean, for instance, a lot of household has this waste that I was familiar with saying that well, we do it on Montgomery Road in other words, we can really imagine. Yeah, we talked about we talked about doing it at the Snow Bowl and places like that, but I mean there is the benefit of doing it on site because you generate all these empty cans and everything. Yeah. And you really don't want to be shuttling these things across the road. Yeah. Well, I'm not suggesting, I'm just saying yeah. that an option because if you're just going to go to Yeah, place. I mean I in my opinion, I think you're you're safer doing it at the facility. Um, you could have a spill or something somewhere else, and it could create a problem. Okay. I mean, at least being on site, you know, we have the means of taking care of it. We have the equipment. Um, if we did it somewhere else, it would kind of not. If we would, and we still at a time when the facility was still open, then you still have kind of like a staffing issue because. Current staff helps out. Can't be in two places at once. <laughs> Although you know, at other times when there was one manager who was particularly panicked about this one year, and we got some volunteers, um, like board members, to, to go out and talk to people as they're waiting in line and, and things like that. So, which is is kind of fun actually. But um, no, it's just an idea. yeah, one of the things also that we might look at doing, and it's, it's not <laughs> resisted this because it's just it's just another thing to do, but. Um, is, is start taking paint to the paint care program. There's a big, a large majority of what people bring in is paint. Like, I'm talking latex, healthy enamels, those kinds of things, things that aren't hazardous. Um, people think all paint's hazardous. Usually something's hazardous because it's, it's corrosive, reactive, ignitable, or toxic. It has to meet one of those four criteria. And latex paint doesn't fall in that category. So they have a program just like the Universal Waste Program. They let you take liquid paint as long as it's the latex. And it's part of this manufacturer take back program. So you get kind of reimbursed for it. It's not a real, we don't pay for the, the paint during the 
hazardous waste collection data that's non-hazardous, but it does create more traffic and it creates more people showing up. So that's another approach we could take to limit the volume of actually hazardous materials coming through. The only difficulty is, is that explaining that to people, everybody thinks paint's hazardous. And trying to say what's really hazardous versus which is not hazardous is, is really difficult for somebody who doesn't deal with this stuff all the time. So you take some of the liability of that determination. Are we hiring a consultant to work on all the You have a highly skilled manager. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, and the, the resistance sometimes has been that the stores are supposed to be yeah. doing the take back program. And so technically you can take your paint to EBS yeah. or wherever, yes. and there's, but it isn't always smooth. And a lot of times people wait anyway to take it to the transfer station. So and they don't always let you know that they have this program because they don't really want it either. <laughs> That's the other thing. I've asked at a couple of stores this year and they refuse. Oh, yeah. I, Hey, I, that's what I was saying, that people, right. it's, it's kind of this like fight between like whose responsibility is it. So the transfer stations say, we don't want to do it because it's really their responsibility. Every so, time you buy a campaign right now, they you add, a, pay they add you pay extra for this. Right. So, oh, you know, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a... 75 well, it's more than that. Also, Walmart and, you know, barber stores, Lowe's, Home Depot, they don't have to participate because they're not technically Right. Uh -huh. So the only two places we recommend people go are Cheryl Williams or uh, Yale Scare Mom, but they are in here. But Yale Scare Mom, I know. Oh, yeah. If you call me, I usually say call ahead because if they get full, they don't have anywhere to put it. That's just ridiculous. That's, yeah, that's the problem. We can say it. it <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a traffic thing, you know, people. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a space thing because you have to use these Gaylord containers. Mm -hmm. It, you have to accumulate a certain amount of it before you can ship it out. So people don't like consuming all that space, you know, in their in their operation. I mean, I think I think it's something we probably ultimately need to do. We just got to figure out the figure out the logistics of it. And I got to get buy-in from the, the crew, and because uh, it's another thing they're going to have to do. It's, it's just we do a lot there. So um, another part. Move into the front, so that's the hazardous waste. So we've got the finance part. Um, Allison created a finance commit finance report, um, finance report. But part of what I want to do is also we have some carry forwards. I'm suggesting out of this budget. So this was a this was a home run budget in my opinion. We did really well. Um, we we underperformed in a few areas. We overperformed in a few areas. The big one that we were we our costs were above anticipated uh, budgeted amounts for the leachate. And we've got these two corrective actions we're putting in place to kind of handle that, which should help once we catch up on the water. Um, but we did really good in terms of revenue this year. And that was due to some um, strategic changing in the fees. So I'll just remind everybody that we haven't had an increase of mid-call solid waste from asking towns for extra money for over three years. It's so, been a lot longer than that. Yeah, since I've been here, I can't <laughs> talk about before. We were right down before that. But. Right, but to hold something, hold the line for three years and not ask the towns for any extra money, I think it's pretty good. And um, these fees, um, I think reflect, or the budget reflects a pretty well-managed budget from the crew and from Beth and Benny and all the other people, they did a great job with this, and Allison and everybody who was involved in this, it's it, it, it just a good budget. And, you know, some of the things you might want to think about, so we have a, an excess, and Allison's going to go into a little bit more, but, um, you know, one of the things we could do is some type of stabilization of fund for a future increased cost in municipal solid waste, so we could soften like the increases that we'll see over time if we put money away in a, you know, in a type of reserve account um, when we have extra like this. One of, the also, one of the other things that could be looked at, should be looked at is, is that we sold the wood chipper that we had and it was just basically rusting in the backyard basically and we weren't using it anymore and we never planned on using it. 
the wood, the chipper operation was costing us in excess of $100,000 a year for the, for the person and repairs and maintenance. And we pay like $7,000 a year to chip all the wood that we generate a year. So it was kind of a no-brainer to move on from that. That, And we sold it for $60,000. So, you know, we really need to work on also increasing our um, equipment reserve because the facility has a lot of equipment. We have, you know, loader, bulldozer, you know, four compactors, uh, baler, all these things are very expensive and they're all very old. So I, I would make the suggestion that, that those funds also, maybe not at this time, but they're going to go in the undesignated fund the way they're sitting now, I believe, but that probably should be looked at, you know, transferring some of that into possibly uh, an equipment reserve fund, along with maybe whatever you decide into a some type of fee stabilization fund, which will help you in the future, so that when you do have some of these waste increases, you can tap into that and soften the, the blow. I think that's a little advanced yeah. right now, for, but Just something for, to start that, that would be for budget, yeah. that budget would be, time. That would be a good line item for in the next couple of meetings, two, three, or four meetings, just to yeah. touch base on, uh, see what we want to do with it, what we actually have for money that we could shift mm -hmm. to that yep. and also get an idea of our equipment. I know at one point we were taking pretty good uh, taking pretty good looks at the equipment and when is this going to need to be replaced and all that type of thing. We're working we on that right a, now. Yeah. Yep. Okay, that's we're, we're gonna have a priority list of all the items yep. and how they yep. how we think they should be replaced. Sure. Because it's aging equipment. Yep. No, nope, it is. It is. Okay, that's good. So you don't expect to remember all this. This is all, you're gonna hear this several times from me, and it'll help you when you get closer to making these decisions, you'll have heard it several times. And you, you know, you're gonna pick it up real quickly. This isn't all that complicated, but it's a lot of information. What's the lifespan of the, apologies for coming in next to you, but what's the lifespan of the landfill? 15 years. 15, rough give or take. Yeah, so do we have closure uh, reserve options? It's all in the budget. There's a yeah, in right in the audit also uh, explains that. But we have a considerable amount. We're of money. in really good shape yeah. for um, yeah. So we have a closure reserve fund, um, which each of the towns hold um, some funds in individual accounts. Um, at Camden's portion, we have about four hundred fifty thousand dollars or something. Um, then each of the towns has whatever corresponding percentage uh, would make sense. And then as a as a group, we have a check one point five million or something, uh, maybe a little less, but where it historically they put in hundred thousand dollars every year to this closure reserve fund. We have those um, one of the next agenda items at some point should be having Camden National um, come in and we have a report. We have the jointly held funds are invested with in a very um, conservative uh, approach with with Canada National and are designated for that purpose. And but yeah, it's for the every year they have to do an estimate of what it will cost to um, close the landfill, which is two point seven point five million dollars or something um, right away. And then the perpetual care costs, um, which they usually estimate after 30 years, but for us it's actually forever um, that we'll have to do that. But we're in, we're in very good shape to have the funding for that. So the perpetual care piece, that's basically taking care of the landfill once the landfill is closed. Mm -hmm. So the perpetual care piece is a piece that people don't think about sometimes. And, and that's why this, this active management of leachate in a different kind of way is very important because that's the number one cost associated with the landfill. Everything else kind of takes care of itself through fees and taxation. But the landfill, once the landfill is closing, you're not making revenue on it, you don't have anything to pay for the leaching. So it's really important to figure out a way to be able to pre-treat or treat the leachate on site. So one, ideally, we wouldn't discharge any to the treatment plant. It would all be done on site. It's very doable. It's just a matter of how and we're working through that. Yeah, I mean, we spent last year around $300,000 on leachate. Our first bill this year, our quarterly bill, um, 
from the treatment plant was $98,000. Uh, so when you're talking about that much money, it makes sense. Last year, we decided to take a little bit of the money, since we were in such good shape with our closure reserve fund, instead of putting the full um, additional 100000 in there, we took 50000 to uh, hire UK Management Solutions to start looking at you know, what our options would be for on-site treatment because you know you could if you could read and they gave us a preliminary um, kind of assessment of what was doable. We can send um, I think that's recorded um, somewhere at one of our last meetings. So if anybody's one of our prior meetings, if anybody is interested in learning more about that, um, it's uh, it's definitely you know even if it costs us a a million dollars or a couple million dollars to do something, um, it it could be paid back um, in a relatively short amount of time given yeah. the expense. So they, when we initially went through all this, they, they they gave us a hypothetical scenario of the cost of an on-site treatment, which was sixty thousand dollars operational a year to do it on site. As a maximum. As a maximum, that was a high end of it because uh, we basically have uh, nitrogen and iron as the two. Things that we're trying to take care of um, initially, but then you have the PFAS component. We're working on something with PFAS component too that I don't know if Allison's going to bring up or not, but um, uh, but they, <laughs> yeah, but it's very interesting. But two prong approach: reduce the volume of leachate is the first one, which we can do with the things that we're doing now, and then try to treat on site for long term. Those are the things we're trying to do. How can we want to just get a brief on that in a little more detail? I mean, I, I've got some interest in understanding that better. Right. I mean, you, I remember you called me, you contacted me back when I had first started talking about this, but once we have more information from, we'll have Mark Liner probably come on and okay. maybe he'll explain all this. Because I don't want to. I don't want to dirty the water, so to speak, with what, what he has to say. But and we I can send all the prior stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah, all the prior stuff that we've got is, mm -hmm. is readily available, but we can, we can send that to you. But anything that is comes through development with what he's doing, that's going to come to us. Right. And, we'll, and we'll absorb it together to talk about it okay. with him as a presenter. We're not that, we're not into the details just yet. Okay. He's working through those right now, so you're kind of right at the beginning phases right. of it. But one of the other things that, so um, I've been talking about, I think Bill, you heard me at the flat red talk about how I feel that PFAS and DuPont and 3M are responsible for the contamination of our landfill. And I've been kind of, I feel strongly about this. And, and, I, and I've been approached by an attorney um, who, and, and uh, actually I was approached by the, the, the deputy Executive Director of NUIA, and he's retired now. And and nobody knows what NUIA is. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, the New England Water, water Association, but they're for drinking water. Mm -hmm. And um, there's been this large, um, let me see here, I don't know if you want to use the right terminology. Just give them a quick. Yeah, so there's a, it's, it's called a, a multi district litigation uh, uh, attempt that they, that they were trying to recover costs associated with the contamination of drinking water by PFAS. And they, they, they filed suit and they ended up getting a settlement, a huge billion dollar settlement to take care of treatment and different costs that are associated with contamination of drinking water. And this, this is a, an environmental um, law firm that they specialize in water contamination and representing municipal entities and um, they contacted me and asked me if that was something we wanted to talk about and it was more on the wastewater side so additional costs for sludge associated with uh, high levels of PFAS because right now we're being regulated um, on our sludge which is with the leftover byproduct of the wastewater treatment facility no, because he's the director of the Tim wastewater treatment plant so he was contacted based on possibly recovery right. costs for that so so right now what's happened in Maine is they've created these bans on disposal. We used to compost all our, lead, all, all our, uh, all our sludge, and now we can't do that anymore because of PFAS. So you hear about dairy farms and those kinds of things that are contaminated, it's because of that. 
So now we're having to put them in uh, the landfill, and we pretty much know our primary source of PFAS is the land is the land is our landfill. So um, we could at any point in time at the wastewater treatment facility cut off and go from sludge disposal because of our lead our our our, our sludge PFAS levels levels. are too high in PFAS. For disposal in the landfill, they could say we're not taking it. That's it's actually not our landfill. It goes to a secure landfill. Another landfill. Jennifer they, Ridge. Right? They wouldn't even be a landfill in the state that could take it. They, and we're we're right on the edge of that. So um, it's really based on based on regulatory limits. So the state has imposed regulatory limits for the two PFAS compounds, six. And, or six. Yeah, some six is what it is, and. Um, and there is there is a possibility you just don't know it could go up high enough where they could waste management or sell it could say we're not going to take it. So this this is like this is like high stakes here. Um, so Camden was identified as one of the one of the treatment plants that has a higher level of PFAS in the effluent, and so um, based on that, the, the state's been doing all this testing. Even before they started testing the effluent of the wastewater treatment plants, they asked um, all of the landfills to be testing their leaching. So we have um, two years of data, maybe four rounds of testing or something, it might be more now, showing um, what the levels are in the leachate that we send over there. And so because we're sort of on both sides of it, um, we know when, when they start to look in Camden at trying to, the DP goes through this process of trying to track down what the sources are of PFAS to these treatment plants because it's easier to try to cut up those sources than to, you know, treat everything over there. Um, they're going through that process and testing what we know that they're going to find. We already know that the, we, the PFAS levels are very high in our leach here. Right. So in general, in most places, they'll set up like a pre-treatment program and make you remove that before you send it to the treatment plant. So that would be more cost associated at, at, the, at the install of this facility. So very hard to remove too. It is. There's only like three real known technologies right now that can do it, and they're, and they're expensive. So in talking with this 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 um, law firm, I, I started explaining the landfill component of it. He's he's definitely going to include the landfill component into this and come probably present to you folks a uh, proposal. For them for us to consider being involved in this um, basically this uh, multi district litigation which would, would recover large amount of money for the costs associated with the removal of this and it would also then also help Camden's treatment facility with any ancillary um, PFAS treatment that can be associated with treating the water at the facility so we could be looking at you know it's not free money, it's it's money that's gonna be needed to be able to do this treatment, but at least it won't be borne by the users. It's gonna be borne by the generator of the contaminants. So that's where we're at with that, which is kind of promising. But is there a particular assumed generator of the best that yeah. through the landfill? So an interesting thing was um, in was talking with the in talking with the attorney 3M and DuPont. 3M and DuPont, but 3M is the larger one, and, and, three, and the reason why it's such a strong case is because the, the, PF, the PFOA and the PFOS are basically a, a fingerprint of who generated that, and there's only one place that generated it, and it's 3M. Mm -hmm. So they know exactly what this case, 3M. Yeah, but did they have a facility here, or is it just the stuff they've been selling in America? It's, it's just everything, it's, it's scotch, right? Yeah. We'll send you some stuff. There's some. There's a good movie. Dark Waters is a really good yeah. movie to watch about it. Or it's great, but it has nothing to do with like a, a manufacturing facility. You know, no, it's area. it's it's what what they found in talking with the attorney is they always there's this thing called cradle of grave, and they're always going after the generator, right? And the generator is the person that puts it in the landfill, and they took a different approach, saying, "Well, we know who the generator is. It's the guy who made this stuff okay. and put it in." Very cool. Right. And they knew it was bad, and they knew they. And they continue selling it because of profits. Okay. So they've acknowledged it. They, they, they just want to, he said, they want to just put this behind them. Right, so they've so, already gone through one major round right. of litigation. They got $11 billion for um, drinking water um, because EPA has now set a standard 
for, or Maine set a standard for drinking water. We're still, a, we still don't have like a set standard for wastewater, um, but they're now, they're kind of going through all these different rounds of class actions. Um, Brunswick, Bangor, they have a few others that have already, some of them have already gone through with their drinking water. But we would, what would be coming to us would be, if I understand correctly, a, signing on to, to joining these other towns as part of a and there's a water. bunch of other towns is that like so like Allison said Brunswick Portland uh, and there was like 20 I think you said that are already mm -hmm. on board with this and what was interesting is Allison <laughs> had done some research and, and this attorney and the the, the the law group was actually they're actually affiliated with the person that initially filed these first lawsuits associated with the contamination of groundwater and landfills um, in that movie. Yeah, what? there's a whole book. This is yeah, like too it. much for one meeting, really. Yeah, um, I cool. can believe yeah. any of it, but we could send some, some background. It'll <laughs> we, be coming to us. Dave, good. we're all excited about it. I'm really psyched about it, if you can't tell, because this is going to save us a lot of money if we yeah. get some. Yeah. It's a big difference between the, you know, when we look at the option for pre-treatment, it's the contaminants that we know about that are already regulated are really not that bad in our leachate, and so it's really encouraging. And then when you think about, shoot, we know that there's all this PFAS in there, that our options for pretreatment go way down and the cost goes way up just because of this one chemical. Uh, so it was looking depressing there for a little bit, thinking, oh, do we not have the money for this? But if, if we could eventually get a, a big so, settlement to help us pay for the cost of treating that, it, it opens up options again. So. So, this is probably actually carry forward. Yeah, so carry forwards, uh, <laughs> carry forwards. So I, I presented a, a total amount of uh, one hundred seventy-eight thousand two hundred sixty-two dollars and seventy-seven cents. If you add up all of the the um, items that, that what's that number again? So it's one hundred seventy-eight two sixty-two point seven seven, and that's. Um, all of the carry forwards that are listed in that bullet in the manager's report yeah. and the um, suggested uh, uses of those um, and they're all they're pretty much unexpected things that happen um, but I think that with the healthy carry forward and balance that we have I think this is probably a good way to move this stuff forward to take care of some outstanding issues and then the big one is 150,000 for the well the bisometer it's just to carry over into the next year because the welding that drilled in last year's budget. And then there's one other last thing. So when you're going into the landfill, and if you go to the right of the recycling containers, you see how there's like that big dip. Mm -hmm. So that big dip is a settlement from the water moving back and forth. And um, it's causing unsafe. Well, I mean, we think that could be the leachate line too and the well. Hopefully it's, it's not water moving back and forth, because that's the thing out that's... Well, it's caused by sediment. What, what's causing it, nobody really knows, but um, it's been settling for the past 20, 30 years. It's it partially part of it. Huh? It was just a golden area? It was part of the landfill, I think, at one point yeah, down, eventually just settling. So that's the gut. So these, this quarry and this one used to be connected by this waste-filled gut here. So it's sort of all one quarry. We, it's like kind of porous material here. Um, there's the, the dam was built here. Um, so what's happening is when the freight liner of the truck that moves these containers into the recycle building backs up, he's tilted this way. Mm -hmm. And then he's picking these roll-offs up and it's, it's, it's kind of kiltered off to the side. And what I want to do is I want to take it from, I want to mill out our FDR, which is recycled pavement into the cell base from from basically from here over to here, it's just like a big square, and I'm gonna I'm gonna fill it, fill it back in and repave it. Um, so it's kind of nothing that was originally budgeted, but we have this these funds. I was looking as with Beth and Jody looking at our financials for some um, facility um, repair funding that might have been set aside, and we had this fund that was set aside in a basically a money market that they had done back in 2006, which is on the order of $60,000. And it's roughly about that to do this job. And um, I'm requesting that we set aside that money 
so that um, I can use it to make those improvements and eliminate that safety hazard associated with the lower wall. Is it worth doing a solar boring in there to find out kind of, all right, am I just put the mandate on a gushing move or just... I mean, what I was going to do is I was going to dig down in there at the same time and look at the leachate line when I'm, when after, I, after I ground all the pavement up and then um, do some probing and see what I see. And if I don't see anything unexpected, I mean, I'm going to put fabric and I mean, you're going to have this situation forever unless you excavate the whole area out. That's my question. Is this I mean, it is putting band I mean, it's it is a serious problem here because yeah. but the, you don't y, have... the Y has, um, this was all before any of us were here, so we're yeah. kind of trying to figure out why they, why they did some of this. But the Y has um, an easement through the facility. Their um, wastewater line runs right through here. Um, and I'm going to look at that at the so same time. So they're, I mean, if they, and we have pictures, we know that the material here is unstable. Um, so, but you can't really, like, because when they dug all that out to put in the dam, you, you could see. Um, but it's, it's boring then. right. You did, you did a lot of boring. Yeah, I don't know if they already. But it would be good to at least make sure that the Y, you know, camera the Y's line. What I was going to do is I'm going to look for our leachate line that goes to the well over here, which goes this way. I'm going to check on that. And then I'm going to have Camden Wastewater camera the line. Because what we found back over here, we had another situation, I think it was over here, where the line had basically done this. It had gone like this. And they just kept on putting pavement on top of it. It, it never really broke. It just slowly kept on bending. <laughs> It was literally like this. I couldn't believe it. I'm talking about the difference. Like a straight pipe settled like that much. It just bent down like that and it was like this. And it was just, there was probably this much pavement in that spot, but it just kept on paving all the way. So probably something similar going on over here. But I mean, in order to fix that, that might be part of a closure plan. You know, you, you yeah. But this like is a long time. Has a problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. I think that's a really good. Yeah. Because if the Y, you know, what happens if the Y's line breaks and it's like, who's responsible for yeah, those paying are that? Okay. We have to dig up our whole recycling area. They did a lot of this years ago, trying to save money by doing these uh, over, what do we call them, overland? Cross country. Like tri cross country wastewater lines that if they don't follow the road, they follow like. As a river or something, yeah. wetland or. Yeah. Well, we'll find out when more forward smells like sewage. Okay, so, right. so yeah. are, you, are, you, are you all set? I, I am, and that was a request for the fund, the transfer okay. of the funding to, what do we say? Okay, so thank you, Eight. Dave. I know um, that was lengthy, but I feel it's important for you guys to hear some of that. And there is a lot. A lot, but he's living this, and you know I think it's important that that's his day to day. You know when he when he's there. So um, okay, next agenda item would be to fulfill that request uh, to uh, for the Mitchell Solid Waste Corporation fiscal year budgeted unexpended line items carry forwards for unanticipated and or ongoing expenses to fiscal year twenty five budget. Um, we've pretty much discussed that. Dave, that was a good, uh, very good explanation. So I'm looking for a motion on that. And that would be the list under finance, or actually, it was in uh, it's also in the manager's report, it's all the same. The facility station manage, uh, station uh, maintenance 45-50-18, Recycling, uh, equipment maintenance and repair, 6625-58. Uh, recycling, building maintenance and repair, 5330-82. Operational costs, those are fuel maintenance, 5981-19. Community projects, the swap shop, 5775. And the uh, capital expenditure, the production well, piece of meter replacement, 150000 which I believe you said is 178, 262, 77. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for a motion to move that forward. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Is there any other questions, comments, concerns? 
I just have one question. It's a little concerning that there was sixty <laughs> sixty thousand dollars sitting around for eighteen years. And that's the next that's conversation. Fair. That okay. is the next conversation. In that case, I'll okay. hold the question. Yeah, I can tell you that I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have comments. Yeah, I have some comments. I have, yeah. I have some. Okay, so if there's no more, um, if there's no more discussion on that, all those in favor. Okay, so for the next, uh, the next subject would be the uh, the sixty thousand or sixty odd thousand that was found. Sixty six seventy six. Yeah, sixty thousand six seventy six. And how many audits have we gone through? And this is something that no one even. Well, you know, and I said I was going to check to make sure that it wasn't something in buried in one of these older audits and I haven't gone, gone, gone back. Um, we did, a couple years ago, we changed from, who was the old one, somebody else, and now we have Fred Brewer. Um, and they've been really great. But, um, this, but this is this is concerning. Well, and, To me. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, um, sure, the thing is that we can bury into, um, it was in 2006. Yeah. So, um, and it's money that it, you know, I think it would be like when I talked about the, the million and a half or 1.2 that we have with Canada National invested because the board decided to do that. It would be, you know, like if every, all of us were gone and forgot that that money was there potentially, um, it's a much bigger number. Um, but I think that's what happened. A few board members decided that they sh should try to invest some of that money. Um, they invested it, it matured. There was this big transition, I think, at that time in 2006, and it, it matured. And then I'm not saying it got lost. Jody had track, had, had Jody could find it. Because what I did was I, I met with her and I said, What are all our reserve funds looking like? And she said, well, we have this one over here, and it just has a question mark next to it. They just don't know a lot about it. And that audit, I identified that battle, but never seen the full audit. I was well, most of, see, the other thing is that most of our reserve funds are restricted for if there's something that the DP told us we have to do. So we have this lily pond escrow that has a similar amount mm -hmm. in it. And it's a little foggy about what that can be used for. Initially, it was you know, potential cleanup costs for lily Pond, and then we also established this this closure fund. So I, I would imagine that previous boards got used to, to thinking, oh, okay, we have these little pots of money that we're not allowed to touch. And that, but it, and I thought when Dave said there we found sixty thousand dollars, I was sure that it was going to be one of these little pots um, of money that is supposed to be for closure or for Lily Pond. And it just appears that this one just it was undesignated isn't. funds that were put into a reserve account that matured, and then when Beth looked into it, she found the minutes. It basically, said that, and somewhere it was an account too, the bank. That's it. That's yeah. all it was. Yeah. Just, it just never got. You know, if you put in a CD, it matures. Yeah. You have a certain amount of time to move it over. Just, it, there was a transition in staffing and managers at that time, and it just got left in the bank. I didn't do it. Before. How did we come across it? Um, well, I was I was investigating all our reserve accounts with Jody, and she found in and maybe it, it's well, honestly, it's possible, possible that it has been. Jody's a finance director who manages our books. Yeah. Okay, and so yeah. she, does she work at the? She works at the Camden Town Office. She's okay. a Camden finance director. Yeah. But okay. She's not our finance director. Yeah, that went, that really. went Finance directors to at one point. Yeah. So Jody's been in now a little bit on, so she would be able to. Okay. She knew it was there. I think, as Alice is saying, we just weren't sure if it was designated. That's the thing, it's really mm -hmm. not that big of a deal. It's just yeah. that we, all, we have this little pond escrow, too, that if we wanted to get ambitious, I believe we could say we could make a pitch to to use that for something and it would be really allowed. But, but historically, the, the organization has not had enough money to do anything and they knew that out any of these other funds had to be saved for closure so they weren't in a position to talk about using it for other things but now we're in good shape and we can um 
look at, at that, and it's I think they've they've proven that this one doesn't have to be restricted. And that there's there's nothing else floating out there like this. No, there is, there. but just it's restricted. But it's, but there are known quantities. They're, they're identified. They're they're known quantities, and they're yeah, okay. No, they're identified. Identified. What like the purpose of restricting? Yeah. yeah. This one is just. It was just out there. Okay. I mean, what do you want to buy? Yeah. So basically, I don't want. I just want to fix the. I just want to fix. <laughs> we the don't. Paper. We don't want the poor guy in so the freight liner to tip over. I mean, over. we can That's just leave it there, 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 and we yeah. cannot deal with that, and we can pay for the payment out of some other pot. You it just do kind it of is a convenient way. thing yeah. to. It that cleans this up. About it it yeah. 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 It, well, it solves two problems. Exactly. Right. So I would. I would move that we authorize um, the facility manager to withdraw the money. From the account that it's currently in, and place it into the facility improvement reserve um, for the purpose of the investigating the leachate line, sewer line, and fixing the paper. I'll second that. Is that a motion? No, it's a second. Is Allison's. Is there any other discussion? The only thing I would add is I just want to make sure that when we do it, we're not making something worse. Like Absolutely. Snapping a line. Putting in, it's like you say, we don't need 10 feet of pavement and then end up stretching a line and busting it. So we didn't think about it. No, we're going to look at that first. As long as we know what we're doing yeah. and how we're spending it, I have no problem. It actually really fits in well with the new well being installed and everything. I can look at all of that stuff at least beyond from the well beyond that point. I don't know what I This have. is the right time to do that. Yeah, I agree. It really I agree. Is. Yeah. And if you have ever been over there and seen one of those trailers, one yeah. of those cans tipped up, it needs to be a level service. It does. It really does. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it sounds terrifying. We're talking like, like a big difference. Yeah, that's, like, yeah, the that's scary. Like okay, so. But historically, they have tended to forget about other things and try to just solve the, oh, we're just going to pave something and not deal with it. Dave is the master at digging into not making, you know, not allowing that to happen. But, um, I mean, no, somebody, invite us over to look in the ourselves. somebody yeah. might look at this and go, oh, we'll just add a whole bunch of pavement there. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. I'm going to excavate it. I'm going to investigate what's going on. The law of unintended consequences. Right. And, and this could get more complicated. I could find that I have a problem with the wise line, and then I'm going to have to legally look at the, the, the deed and the, the easement with the why, and they might have to pony up some money to fix this line. Or we could find that our only chain line has infiltration problems. Could be anything. Okay, so we've got a motion and a second. Are we ready to vote? All those in favor? That's that. Okay, the next uh, next item on the agenda, treasurers and uh, report and financials. I think most of the stuff from um, my treasurer's report has kind of been intermingled into the discussion um, here. Overall, um, you know, we're in, we ended in in good shape and that the reason for that is because we um you know it's, it's a few things that went over we've been it was a generally good budget or under budget on wages and a few things um and that speaks to you know, good management over there um the, the big things though are we adjusted the fees um and we do that that's not something with the bag fees. We try not to do that every year because it's just annoying for people and we have to let the, you know, all the select boards know and there's kind of an antiquated process for that. But, uh, so we set those fees based on um, estimated expenses, but it's, those fees are gonna stay, at least for the solid waste, are gonna stay the same for at least the next few years. Whereas our costs are going to go up some as they do. So that um, in year one of the fee increase, we can expect a larger differential between um, the MSW expenses and, and revenues that will be diminishing over time. In the past, what they did when we had things like 30 year contracts um, for waste, they developed this tip fee stabilization fund where at the beginning of the whole thing they were paying into that fund and then taking out. Um, we don't have such a long contract at this time. Everything's sort of more volatile. We don't know what our expenses are going to be for the next contract. But we should just be, you know, 
mindful of the fact that this will be one of the best years, um, most likely. That the fact that we did so well there is funding things like deficits in the landfill, um, and um, that's basically um, it. Just looking at trying to make sure that we keep these sort of consistent with what the costs are. Also, the landfill revenue that we have, um, it used to be that we tried to really hard to limit um, people coming in only from the four towns. And, uh, and we were sort of keeping those fees a little bit artificially low, thinking, okay, it's a service to the, to the member towns to be able to provide this construction debris disposal. Um, knowing that the landfill revenue um, right now that helps to pay for the, the costs, but the revenue isn't going to last forever because we're about to close the landfill. But the costs are, at least some of them, are going to last forever. So, in the short term, since not everybody uses that demolition debris landfill as much as others um, or at all, we kind of felt like we have a responsibility to maximize the revenue generating capacity of the landfill while it's still open um, but then not you know so sort of charging what the market will bear at the landfill without um, you know without raising a fee so much that we cause everybody to just you know find some other disposal source yeah, so if, if I recall correctly for the people that are new one of the things that I remember hearing was that there were people from neighboring towns coming in and filling up, you know, like construction debris and bringing things to our facility because it was less expensive. Am I confused? No, that is, that, yeah, that is. So basically we were losing our capacity to serve as a dump for the citizens of our towns because people from outside the consortium were coming in and filling it up. And, and so that was sort of this, like, oh gosh, we gotta keep those people out at, at first. Um, but at the same time, it's a major revenue generator for us. So turning down major revenue in the interest of saving capacity for- 12 more months. Yeah, because the, mo the, the, the landfill isn't being mostly filled up by you and I bringing like a two by four here and, and there. It's it's a business for, for people. So it's major demolition that's happening and, and the decision about how much do we want to sort of subsidize that business. And we had, a few years ago, we went through like, okay, what are the other options for everybody? Um, and we, it's an important revenue source for us. I guess it's just what I'm saying. And so it's, it's good to, to stay on top of what um, we, the towns are mandated by state law to provide MSW disposal, so municipal solid waste. We have to have a system. We do not have to have a construction debris disposal option for everybody. We have this whole issue of a landfill that has to be filled up because it's a quarry and you know we can talk all day about about that. But um, we felt that we didn't want to be just saying, oh, well, it's our responsibility to make sure that we can provide cheap construction debris dis, you know, disposal for our residents. And if somebody from Rockland is willing to pay $200 a ton, then we should, we should be trying to get the highest revenue possible, not just being obsessed with whether it came from a certain town. But that can be a whole you know, day's worth of workshops, but it's things like that that are helping us keep it from costing the taxpayers more. Because not all taxpayers use that landfill very much. Dave, do you have any concerns about C and D compliance and people accepting? Because it's a fairly not real tight process. No, I mean, I mean you you sometimes you <laughs> Sometimes you have to be concerned with some of the construction demolition to be like asbestos containing. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, we have, we have um, annual landfill training that's required by our permit um, for identification of those things. 
Uh, we we can take asbestos. We have taken asbestos. But you have daily coverage. Well, I mean, you're supposed to wrap it in 6 ml poly. It's got to be labeled. It's got to be buried at the time of disposal. Right. It's going to be marked on a map. Um, so we don't want it. It's not something we're advertising to take because it's 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 it's, it, it, it's it's costly and it's difficult to do. And uh, what will happen a lot of times is the DP will notify us that hey, we've got this 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 asbestos waste from a certain location. Could you take this? They'll ask us. That. We have taken it in the past, but it's not something we're, we're in the business of doing. It's not really considered an asbestos landfill. So we'll dig a hole out of the We'll dig a hole out of the box. Right, there's not a lot of it going on. Um, I just don't know. I, I guess my question by is. Law, by law, the code enforcement officer, anybody doing a demolition in any town, the CEO is supposed to, like, when the demolition occurs, they're supposed to inspect the building and clear it and make sure that it doesn't contain ACM. And, and, and if they're not doing that, then they're not protecting the other people that are working in this industry. So if you have people in your in your town that are demolishing buildings and they're not being identified and looked at before the demolition, um, they're probably breaking the state law and doing that. So any, I can't remember the cutoff, but there's a, any buildings that were that were built before a certain period need to be looked at. And I can get you that information. Kind of caught me a cold on that one. So No, I, yeah. what I was thinking just is that you know somebody drives into the landfill with a with a, with a dump full of whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the inspection and compliance aspect of it, I was just curious if we were at all concerned with, you know, taking oil based paints that people are Oh we we are really upset. we're watching I mean you can't put something in that I mean you might be able to sneak something in if you're really good. That's really, really watched. I mean, John is not the guy that the guy that <laughs> the guy that watches that doesn't let anything slip. Because yeah. he doesn't like pushing around with the bulldozer either. And then yeah, I mean yeah, it's it's so much bad. It, like driving by the rock landfill, not to pick on anybody, but um, it was different. There's a lot of yeah. stuff that they you know plastic bags flying around sometimes. And this is wood it's exclusively wood demo. For the they don't let any plastic in there. No, no uh, gypsum. We don't let gypsum go in there, which is cheap so, rock. Yeah, that all gets collected at the roll off down by the metal container. Uh, it's really, really. So you have a good sense of the waste segregation for me. Absolutely, it's looked at at the gatehouse. It's looked at when it goes up to the landfill. If you, if you, if you, when it's dumped on the ground, John's looking at it. Every load, it's not, it's not loosey goosey at all. Sometimes he takes stuff, does have to take stuff over the offer that he's done by, but. Yeah, he lets people know. <laughs> All right, good. Yeah. I dealt with it on the other side of it in my career, that's why I had Oh, yeah. I've, I've, I've done the same thing. Okay. C and D is a tricky one. It is. And as long as you feel good about it, that's what we're not. I, I do. I, I do. And I think that they, he does a really good job. And we're not, we don't have the, the frequency of big loads like you would at a bigger landfill. So it's, it's manageable. So it's you easy know? to see it. It is. And every load's dealt with. He sees it. Okay. Uh, every once in a while, someone catches something off guard. There'll be a bag of trash there, or something like that. And, you know, you get the lunch or something. But for the most part, it's fairly well looked at, and regulated, and managed. Could it? Could be that? Calls, we deal with a lot of calls of people that are very, very nice. They call, they ask their questions ahead of time before coming. You know, even if not landfill, but we get a lot of that, which is appreciated. So we have. Right. We have the operations manual which outlines how all this has to happen. And our, our operation manual is, the, is our rule book for how to run the facility. It covers every aspect of the operation. And, there, and every year we go through the operations manual. Um, one of the things we're having problems with are boats. So people would want to bring boats into the, into the landfill to get rid of them. And they have oil, tank, oil in them and they have a gasoline tank. We had one person that brought the boat up and just dumped it and took off. And he said it was all been decommissioned and it hadn't been. It had, had a big oil gas tank in it. And we had to call Queen Harbors, had to notify the DP, had to follow the hazardous waste exclusion law for taking care of all of that. So we have had. And the things. police made almost no effort. We had, we had film of it, but we couldn't find the culprit. No. Um, 
They didn't really try. And it was expensive, and you know that, that's a cost to the taxpayer to have to do that if someone sneaks something like that in. Thanks, I'm just curious. Yeah. So we have the the uh, expense and the and the uh, revenue all looks in line. That is there anything with the AR that is needs to be a venture or are we good? No, everything's on um, update. Um, yeah. I'm going to check for that the large account that pays at the end of the month. Yeah. And I'll get that in, I'm sure. Um, and then there's a couple of accounts that I've made some calls in there. Okay. Thank you. So before a final motion, Dave, like, is the, can you speak to the press release and uh, what that what that's involved as a uh, yeah. Well, I was gonna one? I was gonna actually Beth and I had talked about it. Beth was gonna give the, like a little breakdown of that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you come here so that Owl can pick up your voice, Beth? What? Yeah, I don't think you can be heard. It's oh, not yeah. much to tell. Well, just. It's just that one figure, and I'll be honest with you, I think I know, but nobody can hear, like, for the sake of, I don't know, um, and, uh, just the, for the recording. The two-hour parking limit, do they enforce that after dark? <laughs> no. Like, do I need to move my damn car? <laughs> we're going to be out of here before two hours. Well, no. No, I, my maybe. car's been there for two hours. You're fine. She's You're nice. fine. Okay. So basically, I got because chalk marked the other day. Every year we get, generally, every year we get a dividend check back from the municipal for the. Um, in this case, it was a combination check, um, a little bit for our property and casualty uh, premiums, and then another one for our workers' comp premium. Um, I apologize, but on the check that I got, the stuff that breaks it down, I want to say it was a, a this from memory, it was about seven hundred dollars. Um, it was refunded from our property and casualty, and the rest was for the workers' comp program. Um, we work closely with the municipal to, you know, keep our stuff um, for the workers' comp um, safety and all those things. We work closely with them so that they're aware of what we're doing at the site. Um, we've had some issues in the past, but every, you know, every so many years, it comes back down. So. This was a decent refund. We, we generally get this. So basically they charge us, and then we tend to get a dividend once everything's all in from all the other municipal um, players, and everyone gets one of these. I know it's Rockland put one in the paper. Um, we don't normally put a press release out, but, but every year they kind of send it along, and we just let the board know. Um, so basically not very many injuries and doing things. No, we, we've been down. <laughs> So, can I speak to that real quick? Absolutely. So we, we had a we had an injury that occurred from a resident that was using the facility. It was an older person. There was when you walk when you're going to the yellow bag area, there was a piece of PVC pipe that someone had taken out of their vehicle, and tucked up against the concrete, and and there was an older lady and she she walked up to the edge of the, the concrete, she slipped on the pipe, she fell down. I think she, she, she hurt herself. The ambulance had to come and get her. Um, I believe she's okay. Um, but, but that was that was a, a user of the facility, not a not a uh, an employee. From the employee standpoint, I don't think we've had an injury all all year. Probably. Yep, pretty, you know where I was going. We this is probably the longest stretch we've ever gone without any work related injuries. So we've done really well this year in terms of the employees um, and. Unfortunately, this the resident uh, fell down, but you know, I'm that's not too bad considering not at all. We've it, had a few over the years, and there's, there's a immunity that we have, it's kind of we call it the parking lot rule. Like, even miles. if any of us go to Hannaford and we trip and fall, as long as you've done everything to your normal standards of what you do in your job, and that includes like sanding when it's winter and things like that. It's not like Hanford though, because we're a municipality sort of protected under the tort well, like, well, they thought That's Act. how I was described to me, like a parking lot. Like Hanford risk, like parking lot and getting out and walking. I'm not. Maybe that's a wrong. Example, oh, it's just that Hanford doesn't have the same kind of immunity no, that, that the municipality has. So that maybe some of the sidewalks are kind of. Excuse me. Is that in our ocean 200 or not? No. No. No, that doesn't. That isn't included. That's that would be Department of Labor. That's not included. So we're sorry it happened. But it, it does. It does affect our insurance. Yeah, 
Yeah, we report it. We let everyone know what happened. We, so we're very good now at safety and what our rules are when something like that happens at the facility. In the past, we've had some lax, laxness there, and um, now we, we know. We have a really strong safety program. We have a nice policy. And, and yeah. Beth does a very good job with Vinny and the, the crew. Yeah. They, they really are top notch with safety. So oh, yeah, in right. terms of the training and programs, and we've had the uh, the um, Kyle from Maine Municipal. Maine Municipal yeah, right? I think he's coming in September sometime. So next time we meet, we'll probably be able to talk about that. And they're always pretty impressed with how good of a job that we do. We had we had an injury back. Well, actually, it was it was um, Jim Annis. He yeah. just recently passed away. And so he, they came down. And they they did a Department of Labor came in and did a wall to wall inspection. Tammy Gross, who I know, and she was that just was a, that was a long time before you were here, too. right? But she just really impressed with how well and how mature the safety program is at the facility. I mean, it's very well done in all yeah. the places. Yeah. That was another too. reason for getting rid of the brush. That was one of the actions they had. You know, the people bringing all this brush and moving all these logs around, and and the chipper, yeah. and the, it was just. But luckily, we weren't fined or really fined yeah. in any great amount. Um, it was, you know, especially some of them have been serious. So we do have a program. We do work it. And we try to keep it up to date. <laughs> it, it can be dangerous to do. Yeah. It's a very it's busy important. facility. But the grinder's gone. It's already it's already it's the grinder was our worst thing. Do they feel empowered? Oh, yes. Fall? Absolutely. It's, it's a very, so I, I was, I had, my background was in safety before. One of the one of the other jobs I had for several years, we won the Governor's Zero Award for Safety, and I know what a really good safety program looks like. And this is top notch. They do a very good job at the facility. They're 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 quite on top of Vinny. Vinny does an awesome job at safety. I mean, he's he's they got everybody has the, the things that they need. They know how to they report incidences. We have uh, deficiency tags that are marked out daily. If there's something wrong. One of them is this roll off. You know, that's one of the reasons that that came off. Um, Don't get stung by bee water over there because they'll make you report it. Yeah, it's. Do right it's, 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 you have a near miss program? <laughs> we did. We, 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 we have, we, we have um, safety meetings where we'll talk about things that have happened. So I'll give you an example. We had a roll, we had a roll off that was taken to another facility, and it was another driver. The lip that was picking up our roll off and went to another lo disposal location in Portland. And he basically didn't follow the, the, the protocol when you went through one of these containers. When you enter one of these containers, the roll off truck basically pulls it onto the thing, and, and you're supposed to use the, the, the mechanism to roll it up. And, and then you're supposed to like kind of jerk it like this for the material to come out. What they'll do, they take a shortcut, is they'll use the, the powering of the vehicle back and forth. And, and this guy did that, and the door, the door that swings all the way open like this, he unlatched and swung around, and he, he emptied this container next to another person that was emptying another container, which you never do. And it hit the guy in the head when it happened. So it gave me goosebumps thinking about it. The guy's, the guy's permanently brain damaged from this whole thing. Nothing to do with us, something with enough, but, I, but what, one of the things we do is, I showed that as an awareness to say, look, this is what can happen, because we do that every day. And, and this is why you don't empty the container this way, and this is why you make sure it's latched this way, and this is why you don't do it next to somebody else, and this is why if you're around it, you stand away. So this you whole- You don't want the public to be milling around right. trying to recycle while the so freight liner is being- we, we, it's not answering a question of a near miss program, but we do talk about the near misses and First aids and yeah. OSHA portable injuries, and we go over all of it. And I just want to add that it's really been since Dave's been at the facility as well that it's, that it's a higher priority than it's ever been to do safety, talk about it regularly, and it's been a big change for me, and uh, I appreciate it. And I hope you all share it. Well, Beth does a good job. We do a good job. No, Dave, Dave makes the culture and we support it. <laughs> you got to have a top down approach, or it won't work. Okay, so we've successfully got through every item on the agenda, which is great. We've done it in a couple of hours, which is good. I want to try to limit our meetings, if we can, to two hours, like I said. After two hours, you start to lose people. You start to lose me after an hour. So um, 
I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to, we haven't met consistently over the last year. I don't want to put any pain on it. You're busy, we're all busy, but I feel we need to meet with more frequency. I see in the nodding of heads, so I think that's a good idea. It depends what, on the frequency propose, Well, yeah. I can't. I, I don't. I don't want to. I don't think twice about. It. No, that's not okay. what I'm thinking. Um, but I feel that as a virtually brand new board, we should at least meet once for the next in, the, in each month for the next two or three months to get everybody up to speed. Don't you think once every two months is enough? Though? I mean, it's, it might be enough, but I just want to get everybody up to speed. Sure. Um, and um, then we can do an, you know one thing is I do, Dave. I, I, I really do, and things are going very well. Yeah. But there's a reason for that, and I want to I want to continue the momentum. Mm -hmm. So if we took the next, let's see, this is August, September, October, and November. If we met so, once each month. Or the next couple of months, just September, October, and then see if we need to do both because then we get yep. into the crazy season. Is everybody agree? You okay? Yeah, I think that we should talk about what we're gonna maybe. I think there's what we've been missing some is you know, the opportunity to just kind of talk more about yeah, that things was and weird. have informational you know presentations. I don't think we have enough things to be meeting and, and voting. On, and I don't, but I think that having some time for presentations from yes. folks that have gotten left off yeah. the past scrap yeah. dogs, you know, wanted to come and give us a presentation about what they've done. The the hydrogeologist that does okay. the report, generating the auditor, a packet for every meeting, that's a lot of work. Yeah. You know, so it I think is, we could have you know, workshops where we, um, you know, it's an opportunity to talk about things like. You know the, the fee schedule or the website or, or maybe um, one of these could be a site visit right. it could be a that's, site visit I it, could, it could be a topic of, with, a, with a guest speaker you know that educates everybody on the board gets everybody up to speed Let's do a site visit for the well, the, so yeah. the the the, uh, the list of things that we do for each the the agenda that's mine and your responsibility, the chair and the and the, and I, and the, uh, the manager. So why don't we sit down and outline some stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we can meet. I think the formality of having a meeting with an official agenda where we go, through, we don't need that every month. I think you know every other month is sufficient to handle those things. But we can have. I, I don't mind meeting and going over certain topics, like in between the meetings. I think that would be a good way to go yeah. about doing it because you're, you're you're talking about trying to educate everybody and, and the, the formality of the meeting isn't really the best place for that i mean i kind of right. took up a lot of the meeting trying to bring you guys up to speed which probably isn't the best place for that i think that's more of a workshop or like let's do a tour yeah, a tour is a good way to do it and then we can work we've got we've got the uh, we've got the wealth management people that are going to want to come in and talk with you to tell you about all the money that we have and where we invest with it. We have a uh, leachate management solutions that's going to be talking. We have the um, the environmental law people that are going to be wanting to talk with you folks. So I think that you stack that into a, a meeting and it's too much. You really want to just talk about those things. And then there's also yeah, some kind of workshops, just like I mean, yeah. that's what we do on the select board. It's where yeah. there's non voting just in exactly. And like one of the other things is like we have 15 years in this landfill, but you know, we really got to start thinking about how are we going to manage how we're going to manage the landfill in a way that we may be able to still get paid, but take resources out that could be then sold. Well, that's like a big like component of this that we need to start looking at. Um, there's all kinds of strategies to make more money with the organization, and I think that's where we need to focus. We need to focus on reducing our costs and maximizing our revenue. And, and that's the only way we're going to be able to make this so that it's not a burden for people in the long run. So I think those are the strategies we got to employ to kind of bring us into the area where we need to be to run this facility correctly. And I don't think you really need to fill a meeting for all no, this stuff. No, it's not yeah. the information. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I'm okay, on board. so what does everybody think about the 
the next meeting be an informational meeting? Yeah, I, I mean, I would like to see like an official board meeting, informational meeting. If we're going to do something yeah, monthly, alternate, alternate. That that that's good because it, 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 the packets are burdensome thing to put together. You know what I mean? And every other month is is is, is, is good. Oh, I agree. But the informational stuff is much more manageable because it's just one topic. Okay. And I think it'll be more helpful. The other okay. thing is if we can have a consistent. What's that? Um, getting the advance notice, uh, you sent the information about when the meeting was going to be out and plenty of time this time, which really helped. And so if we could have meetings on, you know, some sort of a schedule that is predictable well, so that basically we can book the yeah. rest of our lives around us. Sure. I also would need to book this world. So. Right. But the, but the tour would fall outside of that. Right? Yeah. We'd yeah. try and pick, pick, pick a Saturday or or a day that you you guys you folks want to meet you know I don't I'm sure people some people are working or aren't always available during the during the day does everybody does anybody have days that don't work for them or times or you I, I can make myself available okay I'm somewhere or another Flexible. Saturdays up until one p.m. Flexible. Okay. So even even during the week, even the week of work for you during the day. Oh yeah. Okay. So maybe we'll talk about. Yeah. Yeah. We did before we did a tour during lunchtime. We're all here. You want to pick a day? Right. Why don't we just do that? Okay. Sure. Let's. That's all like the last week of September. Yeah. Sure. Or is it the third or the fourth Wednesday that we normally? Fourth Wednesday, right, Beth? Last week of September. Yeah. Uh, September 25th. Oh, gosh. Is that? Yeah. You want to bump it up? But that'll be just a workshop. I'm the toast for three weeks. The last week is fine. <laughs> He's so like, I can't do the last week. October the fourth. Yeah. Is it the whole week or the same? I will check on the Monday because we can send an email. Or just last night? Could we do Thursday during the day? Or or are you Kurt, you went on the tour though before, right? I did. I don't have to be yeah, there. Yeah, I was going to say, I, mean, I don't want to leave you out, but do you want to? No, 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 I don't have to be there. Okay. You're important, but I want to. I think it's for me. Oh, come on. <laughs> I don't how believe it. How much time for the tour? A couple hours? Or? Whatever you, however many questions you ask. No, I'll shut up. <laughs> so the last one, Dave, I think was like about an hour and 15 minutes, yeah. something like yeah. that. Well, and hours. it was, it was great. It yeah. really was. People enjoyed it because it gave yeah. them a better feel for what's going on. Yeah. I would say Wednesday or Thursday is easier for 25th. 25th. Yeah, I can do it. Is that a Wednesday or Thursday? Yeah. That's a Wednesday. Um, That's a little slower. What time? Typically. How about 2 o'clock? Is that? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And we needed the transfer station. Yeah. Why are the conservation commission meetings? Please wear your steel toe boots if you have them. You don't let me know. Oh my, really? Hard safety line. We're going to go in the landfill and everything. That, I mean, we follow the safety rules. Right? You want to nail it. That's right. You're what absolutely you right. Sure. So we're saying 2 o'clock? Hold on. Can we just make sure that there's not a conservation commission meeting then? Oh, I'm I'm using the Wednesday, Wednesday. Yeah. Oh, and then he said steel toe. Oh, did he say steel toe? If you don't have them, it's I don't have any. Okay, well, we'll, 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 we'll keep you in the, the safety zone. Okay, well, I can we just, well, we still I have, I have wobbly night. feet and bad feet and ankles, yeah. so I'll just stay where it's safe. <laughs> this is going to make, take the place of the, of the workshop, the tour, the next one. So, um, two or four. Okay, we've got that. I'll take a final motion. Move to the Second. Moved and seconded. Everybody, all those in favor? 100%. We're done. Next time, I'm going to All right. Did I take your paperwork? Okay. Thanks. So, bye. Yes, so I didn't mean to give you the big giant brain dump there. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. So, it, it, no, it helps to hear it more than 
was 